Okay, I think we can now make a start. Um, my name is Len Gray. I'm uh, in Brisbane at the University of Queensland, and I have the privilege of hosting this uh, webinar this afternoon. I'm one of the uh, senior investigators on the Partnership Centre. So uh, throughout the seminar, you'll have an opportunity to submit questions and comments and uh, around the presentations, and we'll try to address these uh, towards the end of uh, our session. So please, please uh, contribute as best you can. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which all participants are joining and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Apologies for these pauses, I'm just changing the slides. So uh, I'd just like to uh, say a few words about the Partnership Centre for those of you who don't know us. Uh, and I'm saying this on behalf of our, our uh, um, Chief Investigator, Jeffrey Braithwaite. So the Partnership Centre uh, is a $10.75 million five-year collaboration involving 17 lead investigators, 20 expert advisors, and over 40 system implementation partners from around Australia. It's a national grant. As you can see, uh, the investigators and partners span all Australian states and territories and work in a whole variety of sectors, including academia, public health, and so forth. Uh, the centre is guided by an international advisory group and a scientific advisory committee and is overseen by a government's authority, comprising representatives of the NH and MRC and each of the funding partners. Our vision is to produce research that contributes to the development of a resilient healthcare system, one that's affordable, cost effective and delivers improved health outcomes for all Australians. Our purpose is to generate and disseminate ideas and evidence to improve the performance of the health system so that it delivers efficiently and effectively over the long term. Uh, particularly, we seek to maximize health system improvement in the real world by bringing together people who provide, plan and need health care. So the Partnership Centre has three main research themes. I won't go through all of these, but um, uh, some of the talks, the talks today relate obviously to a couple of these themes and uh, we look forward to, um, to hearing them uh, from uh, Rochelle and from Tracy. And uh, this, uh, this slide shows you what we're all pleased about and that is uh, over the last three years, our network of collaborators has grown very substantially. And we hope this reflects the importance and the impact of the work that we're doing. And we're grateful to all of those of you in the audience who are contributing to this effort. So that concludes the um, introduction. I'll just uh, make a couple of other introductions before we uh, proceed with the talks. So, um, this is the third in a series of six webinars that the, the centre is hosting until May this year. The March webinar will be on the subject of um, subject of implementing, uh, evaluating implemented health services, and that will be on the 30th of March. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. It will feature Prof. Um, John Carnan uh, from Flinders, Yvonne Zarinsky from Macquarie, and uh, Henry Cutler from also from Macquarie and you'll, you'll be able to access information about that shortly. So to get down to the real business of the day and the topic, not yet business as usual, how are alternative models of care changing the health system and healthcare? Uh, we have two speakers, both of whom uh, you'll find very interesting, I'm sure. So Professor uh, Rochelle Buckbinder will speak on her ongoing research on the uptake of hospital in the home in the past decade and whether upscaling it could lead to reductions in unnecessary health system expenditure, really topical um, for the present day. Ra Rochelle is a rheumatologist, a clinical epidemiologist in Australia, and HNMRC's senior principal research fellow, 
and a lead investigator in the reducing waste and low value care stream. Um, she's the director of the Monash Department of Clinical Epidemiology at the Cabrini Institute, and she's a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine at Monash. So without further ado, thank you, Rochelle, and uh, uh, we're very interested to hear uh, what you have to say. I am got, I, I'm hoping that everyone can see my slides. So I'm going to talk about our, our part of the Partnership Centre. And as you've already heard, there were really three parts. And I'm involved in the second one, which is reducing waste and low value care and particularly part two, which is, can we get the same or better care at lower cost? And in the first um, couple of years of, of this grant, we, we did two large um, projects. The first one was to do a scoping review to determine what is known about alternate delivery models. And we reviewed systematic reviews of trials or economic evaluations relevant to high income countries that have been published between 2012 and 17. And this information was given uh, to Australian stakeholders in a Delphi study to try and identify which alternative delivery models of all the ones that we reviewed should be considered further for either further investigation, piloting or working out whether we should scale them up. And I'd like to acknowledge these three women, Denise O'Connor, Rebecca Jessup and Paulina Putrick, who really have led this work. Uh, so from the scoping review, we actually reviewed 531 systematic reviews. And today I'm just focusing on the ones that, uh, on the part of it that looked at uh, uh, reviews that focused on shifting care away from the hospital setting to the home. And there were 32 of those reviews. And our Delphi study involved 82 uh, different stakeholders and they identified 14 that they ranked as the most important and provision of early discharge at home for people uh, with, um, um, with a variety of conditions, sorry, were, were ranked uh, highly. And so that's why I'm going to focus on that today. You can he see here that early supported discharge and rehabilitation at home was ranked number six out of, out of um, the, all of the uh, models that we presented. And in the, in the text underneath the heading are all the different conditions where there is some evidence or um, papers about the different conditions. And the ones in blue look to be the most promising. So mild stroke, uh, joint replacement and palliative care. And just at the end, I'll just talk a little bit about another high ranked condition or high ranked priority, which was looking at home versus inpatient chemotherapy. Uh, and that was ranked on number eight. And the ones in blue are the ones where there is some evidence for at least equal uh, health outcomes. So at the end of 2019, uh, the Australian Health Minister, Greg Hunt, um, proposed that he was going to have a revolution of hospital in the home to shake up private health insurance, uh, stating that it would provide more choice, better clinical outcomes and better efficiency. And he ex explicitly linked the plan to curbing spiraling uh, premiums in the private health insurance uh, setting. Um, these plans have been put on hold really because of COVID, um, but in, in any case, this is, this is our topic for today. And Hospital in the Home was first introduced in 1994. Again, uh, it was introduced with the idea that it would save costs while maintaining high quality patient care. So the question is, what is the evidence that it actually saves costs? And this is data from a systematic review published in 2017. And overall, there is actually insufficient evidence of either an economic benefit or improved health outcomes for hospital at home compared to in-hospital care. And out of all the evidence, um, post-elective surgery, mostly orthopedic surgery, stroke and COPD has the best evidence. Uh, and so for, for, for post-elective surgery, we know that it... Uh, probably shortens hospital stay by about four days. So that's there's moderate certainty evidence for that. 
the health outcomes don't seem to be any worse in terms of mortality or readmission and uh, probably results in slightly higher satisfaction. But there is very low certainty evidence uh, about its effect on costs. For stroke, um, and this is really mild stroke, again, it doesn't seem to be any worse in terms of mortality or readmission rates. It probably reduces the risk of living in an institution at six months, but that's low certainty evidence. It probably does reduce the stay in hospital. And again, there is unknown effect on costs. And finally, for COPD, uh, there's actually unknown effects on mortality. It might reduce readmission rates and unknown effect on costs. So let's, so let's assume that it, that it might be cheaper uh, and turn to what the uptake of hospital in the home is in Australia. Uh, this is a study that was published just last year in the Medical Journal of Australia, well after we'd started our project that I'll tell you about in a couple of slides. Uh, this was a study that, that looked at hospital in the home uh, from 2011 to 2017, and it found that it comprised 3.7% of all hospital admissions. The median length of stay was longer, um, but it was less likely to involve readmission or death. And the, lo the longer stay was really because of the home component. And over those six years, uh, the admission rates had increased more rapidly among hospital in the home compared to inpatient admissions. It's important to note that this study was based on 19 of 28 unidentified principal referral hospitals, which means that they're very, these are the largest hospitals in Australia. Most of them would have an ICU. Uh, they'd all have ED, cardiac neurosurgery and ID units. And the data was obtained from uh, data that was submitted to something called the members of the health round table. Uh, so not all hospitals are members of, of this. And the, and the authors state that there's probably no WA or Tasmanian data among those 19 hospitals. So how uh, generalizable might this be to Australia? Well, we know that there are 693 acute uh, hos public hospitals and 300 acute private hospitals in Australia. So even though these are the, the largest hospitals, they're by no means the majority of the hospitals. This is just some data uh, from their study. So it showed that uh, it lengthened uh, overall length of stay from 2.7 days to 7.3 days, but it did shorten inpatient stay by two days. And so there was five days at home. These, I'm not gonna run through this list, but these are the most common um, conditions that were treated with hospital in the home. So various infections, uh, venous thrombosis, uh, and malignancy and aftercare after joint replacement uh, were um, most of them. And this slide shows that over time in those 19 hospitals, the rate of hospital in the home seems to have increased between 2011 and 2017 and increased more than the, num the, the rate of inpatient care. So turning to now to what is the uptake of early supported discharge in hospital in the home across all Australian public and private hospitals. Uh, and the, these data has, have been obtained from the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority. And so it contains patient level information on all care episodes across both public and private hospitals. And we've extracted care for patients who've had at least one night in hospital. And uh, the databases are the Acute Patient Care National Minimum Data Set and the Private Hospital Data Bureau. We were able, we've been able to look at the patient characteristics just for 2017 to 18 across public and private. We, we started to look at trends over time and our plan uh, in the future is to try and estimate what the potential for cost savings might be if, there is an, if we can increase hospital in the home use. Uh, using uh, propensity scoring uh, and using a hospital perspective, so likely to underestimate the true costs, you know, from the from the patient perspective at least. Uh, 
Okay, thanks so much, Rochelle. Uh, I can see lots of questions appearing. Really good topic. Lots to think about. Um, so uh, we'll we'll take questions at the end. So we'll now move on to uh, to our next speaker, who is um, <coughs> Dr. Tracy Tay, and she's going to speak about um, work uh, within New South Wales Health related to establishing a virtual care accelerator in response to COVID-19. And this is a multi-agency 18 month program uh, aimed at providing safer care and better access for patients during the pandemic. Tracy is a staff specialist anaesthetist at John Hunter Hospital and a clinical executive director at the New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovation. She's worked in a number of clinical and management roles throughout her career, including Director of Perioperative Services at John Hunter, clinical lead at the ACI for four years until 2016. And she has extensive experience supporting clinicians and managers to resign their service, redesign their services to improve care for their patients and clients and developing practical partnerships across the primary community and acute sectors to develop explicit and locally agreed pathways of care. So it sounds very interesting, Tracy. So over to you, thank you. Thanks, Len. I'm just hopefully share screen fairly quickly. And okay, can everyone see my screen? Fantastic. Okay. Um, yes. And thanks, Rochelle. I really enjoyed your talk as well. Um, and it struck me as I was listening to you that um, while you're uh, learning a lot more about hospital in the home, virtual care and telehealth is sort of a bit further back in the innovation pipeline and we're, uh, we're, we're learning about it and we're learning about how to, um, to evaluate it as well. So we're, we're sort of at a several stages behind you. So I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts about um, the overlap between virtual care and hospital in the home. Um, okay, so first of all, um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. I'm on a Wabakal land at the moment in Newcastle, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any First Nations people who uh, are with us today. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, I'm a co-chair of um, a very large and very talented virtual care accelerator working group that consists of eHealth, um, ACI, Ministry, Clinical Excellence Commission and members from the local health, local health districts and specialty health networks across New South Wales. Um, I'll cover a very wide range of, of uh, points here um, and I'll get stuck into it. So the first thing to acknowledge is that telehealth and virtual care is not new. Um, and the, the most um, successful uh, initiatives go back all the way to 1998. And you can see the sort of um, areas that were deemed um, appropriate for telehealth or virtual care back then and how, it's, how it has um, evolved over time. And as you can see, there is hospital in the home there from 2016, very explicit programs. Uh, and it, it ranges across all sorts of care. And we have been working on this um, at ACI to try to describe the, the range um, of ways in which telehealth um, is uh, and virtual care is currently used. And I think the exciting thing for us um, doing this work is that we actually don't know where it will go in the future. Uh, and so a lot of the work of the accelerator um, has evolved into understanding how will we uh, improve the readiness of our local health districts to springboard and to innovate in the future into areas we, we can't even imagine now. Um, so, We've, but this is a very new, evolving um, sort of typology. But what we found was that whenever we talk about virtual care, people want to jump straight to the technology because that's the bright, shiny bit. And uh, everyone gets very excited about that. Uh, but what we've also learned over time is that if you drop a piece of technology uh, into a clinical setting, 
without uh, understanding, first of all, what your own model of care is, uh, it often um, is a very, very expensive waste of time. And as a clinician, I know I'm just, if it doesn't work quickly, just push it aside and I'll carry on in the way that I've always worked. So I'm, I put this up because I, I felt that as, um, as researchers in particular, you may be interested in, in seeing how we are starting to tease out the components of virtual care. And the first part is why are you, you know, what is the care you want to provide for a patient uh, or for their families and carers? Or what are the support functions you want? Choose that first and then say, how could we connect? You know, um, what's the purpose for wanting to even consider virtual care? And then lastly is the technology and the how, which modality, modality will you use? The next set of slides are quite busy, um, but just wanted to give you a sense, and I'm just trying to watch the time as well, so I don't go over. Um, there's just different settings with the other crosscut when we're looking at virtual care. So um, for the accelerator, we were given a, um, a couple of areas that the ministry particularly wanted us to consider. Um, and this is right at the beginning of COVID. And, and the first question we had and why the accelerator was funded and um, set up was to look at what types of models could be stand up quickly, what virtual models could be stood up quickly to support um, either patients who are COVID positive or COVID negative patients who were vulnerable and we wanted to keep them away from hospital. So one of the, um, the settings was around emergency models of care. Uh, and as you can see, the first thing is that it's, um, it's about emergency care, that what you want to do is connect hospitals with residential age care facilities or hospitals with hospitals, and then the modalities that you use are there in the middle. <clears throat> Um, this is where I was going to show some videos, but we don't have time. Uh, but these are some of the really um, exciting models that are out there that are, are um, active, delivering care already, and um, have have some of them have been around for quite some time, uh, and are really, really reaching out across across New South Wales to provide care. Um, the next one's an admitted models of care, and again. The what is it that you want to deliver? What care, clinical care do you want to deliver? Who do you want to connect? And these are the ways in which you can connect. So there's the modalities. Interestingly, these um, diagrams are, have also been used um, in terms of our funding models. So for each of these, there is a funding model, which is also important to support this because if, uh, if um, there's no way of, uh, of paying for this, then people are less likely to support it. And again, there's some uh, admitted models. And of course, hospital in the home is technically there. Uh, and again, we've got amazing virtual allied health services in Western New South Wales who connect um, around um, things like podiatry, speech pathology, physio, um, and provide support to patients and to clinicians at great distance. Then the non-admitted models, um, patients in their own homes with remote monitoring is an, um, one of the, the um, initiatives that has accelerated rapidly during COVID. And one of the, the big uh, ones that most people will have read about seen in the paper is RPA virtual uh, and it segued quickly from it was already in existence but it, it accelerated to support COVID positive patients at home or in um, the, the hospital hotels uh, and then now has segued very much into looking after patients with chronic disease and keeping them out of hospital and again quickly you can see the different connections that can be made uh, and far west, some of, the, some of the rural models have been absolutely amazing. And as you can see, there's one patient there. Um, and part of the accelerator has actually been uh, purchasing these sort of kits of um, blood, you know, speak manometers, uh, pulse oximeters, thermometers to give to patients to take home. And again, some amazing non-admitted models there. Um, you know, the first one there is uh, the, the DOT um, 
program of uh, observing patients taking their pa patients with TB tuberculosis, observing them taking their medication. Okay, so to the virtual care accelerator, um, which is the this multi-agency uh, unit that has been um, was established at huge pace right in the beginning of the accelerator, and it was really the emergency operations unit that um, asks eHealth and the Agency for Clinical Innovation to stand up um, a, a group that could. Um, uh, accelerate or identify, first of all, the um, virtual care initiatives that could be um, hopefully scaled and spread. What happened, of course, is that COVID, um, the threat of COVID has over time gradually declined, although it's still there. And so what happened was rather than concentrate only on five, six, seven, eight different uh, models, what we've now been asked to do is to start to consider what does the next five years of virtual care look like? Uh, and it's a really interesting space to be in because what's happened is we had all these very rapidly established units um, and some of them have been absolutely amazing. Others have started to fall away. And evaluation of a unit uh, and a process that has been rapidly stood up um, doesn't actually tell us what that same unit process, if it had been established at a, uh, in a more considered way, whether or not it could deliver better outcomes. So we're in this funny space of, of uh, trying to identify uh, how we will measure patient experience, clinician experience, health outcomes, and cost of care. Um, but if we apply that to our current initiatives, we may find that um, they don't um, show as much benefit as if we had established these initiatives um, in a more considered way. So uh, I think it's very interesting at the moment looking at the research uh, and the evaluations of the current uh, virtual care initiatives across the world. And I don't even know really what it's telling us. So uh, it's, it's an, an area of great discussion for us. But at the moment, what we've said is, let's use this time to make sure that districts across New South Wales have the foundation pieces for good virtual care. Um, in the beginning, we, we did identify eight key focus areas, aged care, home monitoring, um, facilitating communication was particularly around isolated patients and families and we, we wanted to have the technology available and the processes available to support um, people who were isolated and potentially um, might die without contact with their families. Um, in reach and outreach, sort of outpatient clinics is the main um, contender there, intensive care, EDs, ambulance research and evaluation. Um, my virtual care is a skin that sits over the platforms that are used for vir uh, virtual care video conferencing in um, hospitals and clinics. And uh, it allows um, uh, scheduling, easy scheduling. So we, we just send the link to a patient and their family care. Um, the person goes into a virtual waiting room is seen by a nurse and then enters the, the room of the um, clinician. You can invite up to 100 people into that discussion. If, uh, you know, for multidisciplinary team meetings, you can invite, um, you know, the daughter in the UK or the son in the US to join this conversation. Um, and it, it works very, very smoothly. Um, and so we're trying to roll that out across New South Wales. The numbers of um, clinical consultations through my virtual care are rising. But the very interesting thing is that virtual care after peaking, um, you know, sort of late last year is now starting to decline and people are starting to fall back to more face-to-face -face, um, uh, consultations. So, as I said, we're very keen to make sure that we use the time now to establish a base for the future. This is very draft, very early, um, but what 
what uh, you will probably recognize this is as a program logic, a logic model. And uh, you can see that there's some foundational activities in the blue, what we are doing. And that's really where we're focusing the work at the moment. But over the next year or two, we will be moving into a five year strategy and starting to measure the um, health outcomes, experience of care, experience of delivering care and the costs. And I've mentioned those. So the big challenges at the moment are really that this evolving evidence piece that I've, I've mentioned. What, what has been measured in the last year may not fully indicate the value of uh, virtual care. Um, and that as we, we take what we've learned from last year and from many years past and roll that into better support for districts um, to, to implement what everyone else has, but also to innovate, I think that is where the, um, the emerging evidence will come from. At choosing the measures and harmonizing the data, uh, at the moment, people are measuring different things and that's a bit, bit hard to, to um, benchmark. And this change in context, who knows, uh, you know, hopefully not, but we, we could be confronted with a, another pandemic or, or another disaster. Um, again, the other challenge is that people want to dive in and, and uh, assume that if you implement a technology that um, things will change. Uh, and we're trying to change that conversation to clinical first and technology second. Um, and then this last slide, safety is something that we are very, very um, uh, aware of and keen to measure the appropriateness. When is virtual care um, the best for patient, the, their condition and for the clinicians involved? Um, and sometimes it's a hybrid. Um, the patient and clinician experience is absolutely vital. If people have poor experience, they don't return to the virtual options. And that is very much um, at the mercy of what uh, communities believe as well as has been seen in the media in recent times. Uh, and that's really all I wanted to share. Um, but again, very happy to take questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy. That was a great, massive <laughs> challenge. Like that looked really, there's a lot of complicated issues there all mixed up and to make sense of that and turn it into a program. You've got five years, that's very good. <laughs> Be exciting to watch. So we have quite a few questions. And um, so um, I'll, uh, I'll present them to Tracy and Rochelle, and I'll start from the top. We might not have a enough time to answer them all, but we'll do our best. So, um, so first question was about, for Rochelle, uh, of the conditions that are supported as appropriate for hospital in the home, is there evidence for improved outcomes, reduced cost, experience of care for virtual hospital in the home? I guess the, the this take I'd put on that is, um, if you deliver hospital in the home, it part, in part or fully virtually, does that reduce the cost and therefore improve the uh, uh, the equations around cost? You'd have to think that because travel is a, is, a, is a necessary overhead in the traditional HIF model. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. There were no systematic reviews of virtual HIF. Uh, but as one of the questions is later on is it, it's not just the cost to the health system, it's a cost to the carers. And, and um, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we know that at the moment. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's to my way of being a telehealth kind of person, I'm thinking this could be the key to, to shifting the balance of cost, but I guess that's, you'll, you'll tell us the answer in, what, 10 years from now, would that be right? So we're working on five years. <laughs> it's a hard question to answer. Again, Rochelle, um, anything about children? Do we know yeah. anything about kids? Yes, yeah, so we have the data across all ages. So the only thing I know so far from the data is that is that in the public setting, the most um, of all the admissions of children less than one and between one and five, um, a high proportion of them are HIF. Um, 
So, um, so we, as we look at the data more fully, we'll be able to answer that question more, um, but it didn't seem to be a factor in the private setting. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll ask Tracy a question just to um, balance out the conversation here. So uh, we're asked Tracy um, about people living in lower uh, socioeconomic uh, areas. Is there a, uh, you know, difference in patterns of use or requirements, the need for interpreters? How do you deal with all of that? Um, I think that's generally the, the subject that people yeah, are interested yeah. in. It's, it's um, a very, very good question and a real concern that inequity, it's almost, it uncovers inequity. So there is a, to, to have um, access to telehealth, you have to have phones, computers, and you have to have data. And that's the other thing that's been really interesting. So what uh, people who, for whom data has been a problem, um, what they tend to do is they go on the phone they might switch on their camera briefly, show the wound or whatever it might be, and then switch back to phone. So um, people have been quite innovative, but it's absolutely true. And there are many people that will prefer to go to telephone than to um, video just to save data. Yeah, I think, uh, again, from my experience, we, we, we hope that the community um, availability of these kind of ubiquitous or near ubiquitous technologies just improves for everybody. That will certainly help with the equity problem. So uh, Rachel, uh, Rochelle, um, I've got a question about uh, staffing mix. I guess the big question is, do you get a different, different patterns of staffing use in, in the hospital in the home setting versus um, traditional hospital setting? Is, is that maybe different kinds of training, different types of personnel? And what are the implications uh, of that? Yeah, I, I guess I can't really answer that either, but I know in, in our hospital, in the home, in our setting, um, there, there is a GP that, that usually visits daily. Um, for the strokes, there is a rehab physician that, that might go less frequently. Uh, and predominantly, the care is delivered by nurses and physiotherapists. Um, yeah. I mean, my daughter-in-law is a is a works at the children's hospital, and her her job now is to deliver hospital in the home to children. Um, so she drives around and gives chemo and in antibiotics. Yeah. Um, so I so I think the mix is less medical and more allied health, which I guess might reduce the costs. So um, there's a question here about um, the uh, the cost imposed on carers, family members when the home care option is used. And uh, you know, I'd, I perhaps could extend that question to say, well, when you look at comparative costing uh, studies, to what extent are the family uh, contributions costed into the model? And to extend that even more, I, I wonder about, you know, often people use DRGs as a kind of a comparator. And uh, my own thinking about that is that there's a distribution of costs within a DRG and the I suspect the low cost end of the spectrum is easier to manage in the home setting and the high cost end of the same DRG yeah. are better managed. So you, you, how do you adjust for that? But perhaps the family kind of piece might be what, what people yeah. are interested in. I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, when we started this, we were pretty naive and we found that there's so little economic evaluation. So we don't even know what the whether the cost is worth it to the hospital, let alone what the, the costs are to the, to the patient and the carer. Uh, so, I mean, that was my bit at the beginning about, well, we don't even know that it's more efficient uh, and it, it might actually be more expensive for all we know, is particularly when we take that into account. Yeah. It's, uh, this is my little bit. It's apparent to me that all care can be provided at home. It's just a matter of what the cost is. You can have intensive care buses parked in your front yard and deliver the care at home, but the cost is astronomical. So every hospital admission, therefore, would be deemed to be inappropriate, but uh, the cost would be cost. very high. So that's what we're wrestling with, this kind of equation yeah. about balance, about balance of cost, isn't it? And it's, it's like for adults with chemotherapy, it's, it'll be much cheaper to have like eight, a nurse, one nurse doing chemo to eight people all at once in an outpatient setting mm -hmm. 
than going one by one. Uh, so, so it might actually be more costly to go to home, but it might be preferred by patients. Do you have any comments on that, Tracy? Um, no, the thing that was going through my mind was the, exactly what Rochelle said in the last question, a uh, last um, comment, and that is, it really does depend if you're doing your economic evaluation from who, whose perspective. Um, and that's what the first question that you always ask. So yeah. we are including in our virtual care evaluation and the ongoing evaluation over the five years will include patient and clinician experience. Um, so we're calling that very important for value. Good, I think this is for you, uh, Tracy, but a question about um, training folks in uh, virtual care. Uh, what, what, what are the, what's the kind of view, at least in New South Wales, about how to get people who are educated in doing this kind of work? So we, we as I said, this is very early days. Um, what we have is we're developing um, modules for training, they could very easily be used um, in undergraduate or postgraduate um, teaching and training. Uh, at the moment, we're, ju we're just getting them ready so that current clinicians can use them. Um, as I said, this is all very rapidly, very COVID related, but um, absolutely. And it, the important thing really, and I probably should have started this way, is that virtual care is just care. It's care. Um, telemedicine is just medicine and so what you're doing is um, you know for example when I started um, as a medical student uh, there were only this many tests to do for heart disease or for for whatever lung disease and now there's many many more and so I think for clinicians coming through now um, and with our foundational pieces being embedded by the time they get out uh, virtual is just going to be one of the ranges of options um, that may be the most appropriate at the time. Lots of good questions here. Um, uh, I have a question, of Tracy, for you again about, I think you referred to declining numbers of people using uh, virtual care. Is, um, you got any kind of insight into who's not using it? Is it, is it particular groups of patients or what, what's the What's under, underneath all of that? Um, the first bit, I guess, is to say that what drove the rise was fear and um, of COVID, fear of, of uh, being, if, if you already uh, had a chronic condition, going to a hospital was the place you didn't want to go to. Mm. Hospitals were very keen to keep people out in case we were overwhelmed by COVID patients. So it served everyone's purposes to accelerate virtual care. Some people have had fantastic experiences of it, but from a clinician point of view, there was never the change management. There was never the support to learn how to do things well. And in my own clinic, in my own perioperative clinic um, at John Hunter, we don't have access to my virtual care, but the skin for, for scheduling people. So we're still going, our poor admin people are trying to schedule in phone calls or video calls in amongst the walk-ins. And so all of that stuff is, it's, it's why we have to go clinical first and technology last, because otherwise it's a very, very expensive waste of money. So we have to, in, uh, we have to go back and retrace our steps uh, and do all the work that should have been done a year ago. And we may lose more people, uh, not lose more people, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, we may lose more clinicians uh, until we get another uptick. But, but speech pathologists, physios, they're still going hell for leather. They love it. Very good. So we've only got a few minutes left. And uh, so we've, we're committed to Tracy and uh, Rochelle answering some of these questions, not many, by text. We, we've got a capacity to send notes. So um, so perhaps I could um, ask a final question to you both. So what's your advice to Minister Hunt around expansion or otherwise of these out of hospital programs? Because he'd be very keen to hear after this seminar, I'm sure what you think. Shelby, no one's know. answering. Uh, well. <laughs> From my perspective, I, I want to see the evidence that it's actually provides at least the same, if not better care and uh, outcomes. And 
that it's achieved at a reduced cost and, and not an increased cost. Because a lot of these things that we, we roll out rapidly later turn out to be ineffective or harmful or wasteful. And I think that if he does want to roll it out, that it's really important that we measure these important um, health and cost outcomes um, yes. to know. Absolutely. Tracy, what do you, what would yeah. be your advice? I would like people to hold off judgment on virtual care just at the moment, because I think at the moment, the evaluations are either overly optimistic um, or overly pessimistic and we need to find the middle ground um, and what makes sense to clinicians what's acceptable to patients and we need to measure that uh, and then I agree we shall only fund what um, what is shown to be provide you know effective care. So of course being a researcher I'd always say there's a need for more research here <laughs> you're looking for the I'm sure you are looking for the funding Rochelle. <laughs> And I'm probably, not for probably a, a very good investment. Because this is a really important question, I think, uh, that needs, you know, clarity in order to build a new system, which I think is happening kind of anyway, but uh, perhaps not as fast as some of us would imagine. Mm. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming along. I think uh, thank you particularly, Rochelle and Tracy, for entertaining us with some really good thoughts and uh, letting us know what's really happening in this world. It's a really important um, style of medicine that's evolving and uh, we need to understand it and invest in it appropriately. So I think it's been really good. Uh, thank, thank you both. Uh, um, to remind you that uh, in the, the March webinar, we're going to be talking about improving health system performance through economic planning and post implementation evaluation of health services. I'm, I'm sort of thinking I'm excited about that. I'll be here listening. So uh, uh, with that, uh, we're right on two o'clock. Thanks everyone for being here and, uh, and hopefully see you again in March. Thank you. Thank you.